What's up, everybody? This is the fifth time, okay? This is the fifth time I'm trying to make this one video. It goes to show that there could be three causes when something's going wrong in your life. Uh, one of the causes could be God might be bringing judgment on you for doing some things that you shouldn't be doing. Second thing is uh, Satan could be attacking you. Or the third reason is you could just be completely ignoramus and just screwing stuff up, which is what I've been doing. Uh, I've already drank all my coffee, so I'm pretty wired right now. I do have my red solo, but it there's water in there. I don't know going my route right now. I'm probably gonna spill it all over my computer, but it's all water. And to make sure we can get through with this video for the fifth time, I got common sense oil. Yes, that's right. Young's Living, I think. Young Living, Young's Living. I don't know. My wife uses this stuff and I use it for sometimes too. Essential oils. So let's see if we can get through this video. Fifth time's a charm, I'm assuming. So, but this is going to be the third and final video in this Jehovah Witnesses Religious Cults in America series that I've done. So we talked about the history, we talked about the organization, we talked about the governing body or faithful and discreet slave, we talked about the New World Translation, their version of, uh, of the Bible and everything. They're different from a Mormon because if you were to witness to a Mormon and you have a King James Bible, they'll both look at that Bible and you can witness and debate theology and everything. Jehovah Witnesses, completely different. You will not be able to have a successful witness encounter with a Jehovah Witness with a King James Bible or any other translation unless it's their New World Translation. Okay, so I just want to point that out. So, but this next video, this final video is going to look at two things. It's going to look at one, the prophecies that they claimed, and two, it's going to look at their own scripture and how their scripture, because it's man-made, made by finite man, contradicts their own theology that they push and we're going to look at some of that but first the prophecies the governing body claims to be god's prophet now on my third attempt in making this video i hit my escape key i was going to take you to a website to show you where i'm pulling these documents up because i'm not going to anti-jehovah witness websites i'm going to archive.org a-r-c-h-i-v-e org archive.org basically an internet archive database and you can pull up all sorts of documents sort of like old microfish and you go into the library and try to find out old magazines and new newspaper articles uh, similar fashion so this is where i'm pulling most all of this information so if you want to be a berean act 1711 check up behind me i encourage you to do so don't just trust what i say but research it and fact check it as well because that's how you share up your faith by doing your own research and study. So, again, I'm, I promise it's just water. <laughs> but here in the Watchtower magazine, one of the articles from 1972, they say that this prophet, governing body, the group of people that make up and head up the Jehovah Witness organization, they claim to be a prophet of God, receive information, and give it to the church members that the church members have to abide by. Different teachings and things. This prophet was not one man, but a body of men and women. It was the small group of footstep followers of Jesus, known at that time as International Bible Students, one of which was C.T. Russell. Uh, they're known as Jehovah, Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. It is easy to say this group acts as a prophet of God, it is another thing to prove it. The only way this can be done is to review the record. What does this show? And this article was written 1 April 1972 in the Watchtower magazine. So let's look at the record of the Jehovah Witness organization, the governing body, prior to 1972 and see how it holds up. Let's go back to 1886, The Time is at Hand, Studies in Scripture, Volume 2. There was numerous editions made. This one was a 1911 edition. This was near the very end of Charles Taz Russell's life. But basically, we read here that in, I'm sorry, in AD 1876, the battle of the great day of God Almighty would occur. 
It will end in 1914 with the overthrow of Earth's present rulership. Okay, so here in the 1911 edition in 1886, they state that the Battle of Armageddon will commence. God's kingdom is going to be set up in 1914. Eight years later, okay, 1886, now we're at 1894, Zion's Watchtower. There is a discrepancy, there is a discussion on changing the date of 1914 based upon what was presented in what's called the Millennial Dawn. You can see to the left of the blue mark there, the blue box. And basically, they hold again. We are not changing the date of 1914. Why? Because we believe it's God's date, not ours. Okay. In the 1915 edition, of the time is at hand studies in scripture volume 2 the battle of Armageddon date was changed it would end now in 1915 okay 1915 the last edition that we read was 1911 1914 now it's going to change in 1915 it changed a whole year because they realized the time the date came and went just like all these other date setters and they were wrong and they got to push a date out and so they pushed it out another year Charles Taz Russell would die a year later on Halloween in 1916 and yet he still has prophetic words that we're going to read in later editions too so here the finished mystery Studies in Scripture, Volume 2, in 1917, about a year after Charles da uh, Taz Russell's death, says, In the year 1918, when God destroys the churches wholesale and the church members by millions, okay, so by 1918, God would have destroyed churches and members and by the millions. I don't recall that happening. I don't recall that in newspaper articles, clippings, magazines, anything like that. Anything done in the millions would be well documented. It says, It shall be that any that escape shall come to the works of Pastor Russell to learn the meaning of the downfall of Christianity. So here we're saying in the year 1918, again, this is written in 1917. So the following year, destruction is going to happen. After the destruction, those people that weren't killed are going to look back on Charles Russell's writings and realize, hey, this was all legit. This is all prophesied of Charles Russell. He even goes on to say, Pastor Russell shall be a sign unto them and will tell them the truth about the divine appointment of trouble. So in 1917, they're holding Pastor Charles Taz Russell, if you call him a pastor, okay, he may be a shepherd. You know, shepherding a flock down the wrong way into ravening wolves and bears and everything. But they're lifting him up to be uh, this prophet of God that he clearly isn't. Goes on to say, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. As the above stated, no one could keep the sayings of Jesus until he hears it. Until he has a knowledge of God's arrangement. Throughout the gospel age, none but Christians have had this knowledge, and all who have kept this saying and keep it faithfully until the end will receive life everlasting. So here we have a works-based salvation, if that's the very least of the concerns here. Okay, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed on him shall never perish but have everlasting life. But that's not what they're saying here. They're saying you have to have knowledge keep the knowledge and keep the saying and live obedience faithfully until the end and that's how you get life everlasting this is a workspace salvation they also promote on the right side that the new order is coming in in 1925 will mark the resurrection of the faithful worthies of old in the beginning of the reconstruction then based upon the promises set forth in divine word we must reach the positive and indisputable conclusion that millions now living will never die. So millions now living at that time will never die. They would be the faithful ones of the Jehovah Witness organization that at 1925, when this revolution, this reconstruction period begins, 
let's say if somebody was just now born in 1920, they're a day old, right? You push it out 80, 90 years old. That's a long life that they've lived. 80, 90 years old, we'll say 90. You're looking at 2010. Those people that were one year old, one day old in 1920 are not alive currently. Accordingly, this revolution and this reconstruction has not occurred. Millions of people, millions of churches have not died by God right now. And this reconstruction has not happened like it said in 1925. Now, what about 1938? So now we're moving on and on. The Jehovah Witness organization is telling their people not to have kids. Okay, we're reading here the first block. Support thereof mark the words of Jesus, which definitely seem to discourage the bearing of children immediately before or during Armageddon. Okay, Jesus discourages no children before the battle of Armageddon. Reading part of the Olivet Discourse, I believe it's from, it says, And woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Okay, Matthew 24, 19, see so yeah, his Olivet Discourse. So they're saying at the bottom, it would appear there is no reasonable or scriptural injunction to bring children into the world immediately before Armageddon, where we now are. Here in 1938, the Jehovah Witness Organization, the Watchtower Newsletter magazine, is saying that we are right before Armageddon. But again, we looked at past articles. It was supposed to happen in 1878, 1914, 1915, 1925, and it still has not happened. Failed prophecies, again, still, of the organization. In May of 1974, 36 years later, no revolution, no destruction, no Armageddon. And people are starting to sell homes. It says, yes, the end of the system is so very near. Is that not reason to increase our activity? Reports are heard of brothers selling their homes and property, planning to finish out the rest of their days in the old system in pioneer service. Certainly, this is a fine way to spend short time remaining before the wicked world's end. Okay, so here in 1974, it's reported that a lot of people are selling all their possessions to live sort of pioneer day. I'm not going to say poverty, but like pioneers, like they're saying, because they believe that the end is coming very near to them in 1974 hasn't happened yet I believe that we're getting very close the signs of the end of the times are definitely coming we're seeing apostasy at a global rate we're seeing just uh, nations against nations kingdoms against kingdoms if you will uh, we're seeing a lot of things happening that scripture records how does the organization explain all the failed prophecies the battle of Armageddon the revolution the reconstruction all this stuff how do they explain it they explain it right here in this blue block. It says, The Bible students held what mistaken views about establishment of the kingdom and harvest. Why should such mistaken views not cast doubt on whether Jesus was guiding his followers? You can pause it if you want and read all that. I'm just going to focus on this very last sentence on the bottom. Faithful ones prove willing to be corrected and humbly adjust their views. Faithful ones prove willing to be corrected and humbly adjust their views. But wait, you remember this first slide that we just looked at? You remember this one? It says it's easy to say that the governing body of Jehovah Witness says they're a prophet of God. It's another thing to prove it. The only way we can prove it is to review the record. What does it show? Remember, this was written in 1974. What does the record show? The record shows that they are not prophets of God. The governing body, the faithful, discreet slave, does not have the information God has revealed only to them. Their information, their religion is man-made. Their current publication reveals that they were corrected and adjusted their views. If you go to JW.org, they are complete, false, fabricated. Deuteronomy 18.21.22 says, How are you going to know a false prophet? If the false prophet speaks anything in the name of the Lord and it does not come to pass, that person spoke presumptuously and do not be afraid of them. They are a false prophet speaking on their own, not of God. That is what they are. A false prophet, a false call, a false organization. 
The question is, how does Charles Russell get these dates? Where did 1914 and 1915 come from? It comes from there. It comes from the pyramids of Giza. Aliens built it, right? No. Aliens didn't build it. Uh, probably the Hebrews built it during their time in Egypt. Uh, but basically, much fascination occurred with these pyramids in the 1800s. Charles Taz Russell looked at a passage in Isaiah 19, 19, and 20, where it says, In the middle of the land of Egypt, a pillar at the border, it will be a sign and for a witness. They shall cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he shall send them a savior and deliver them. Charles Taz Russell looks at this passage as being prophetic to Isaiah, but current in his day. And so he's looking at the passages in the pyramids of Giza. He looks at the entrance passage, if you will, and measured it and found out it was 1,542 inches. And he, for some reason, he associated that with the year 1542. Then he looked at the second passage and figured out it was 3,416 inches, being 3,416 years from 1542, bringing it to 1874. But then he realized that he transposed the numbers incorrectly from 3416 to 3461, which ultimately changed the number, the year, because of the mathematical equation that he used in there. But basically, that's where he got his dates from measuring certain passages of the Pyramids of Giza. Again, it all boils down to Isaiah 19, 19, and 20. I haven't studied this passage out. If you want to, by all means, check it out. Let me know what you think in the comments below. But I have looked at a couple. I've looked at William MacDonald and Warren Wiersbe's commentaries, and they both believe that this passage is a prophetic passage, looking forward towards the millennial messianic kingdom time. It is prophetic then, it is prophetic now, because it has not happened yet. So the Jehovah Witness organization, again, failed prophecies, failed date settings. They originally said it was of God, and it became untrue. And uh, we're realizing that their prophecies are not coming to pass. They are not representatives of God. Again, I said this in the beginning. If you were to try to witness to a Jehovah Witness using a King James Bible, they will reject it. If you try to use New American Standard, New King James, any other one, they will reject it. The only way that you can reach somebody through Scripture is through their New World Translation. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can use to point out to a Jehovah Witness member to make them go, huh, or think about it. One thing I will say that normally I've, on, I've only seen Jehovah Witnesses go out in twos. And when we've had witness encounters with them, they would have one person doing all the talking and the second person silent. Whether they say that they're praying or they're just learning from the teacher that's doing all the talking. I wouldn't so much focus your attention on the one that's doing all the talking. I would focus your attention and your eye contact on the one that's silent. Okay, this is what I did that one night when we witnessed to a couple of Jehovah Witness ladies. I don't know what happened there, but it looked like there were some thoughts of consideration that I was able to give her. So let's look at New World Translation. First, let's talk about simple hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is how to properly interpret scripture. Okay, so you get Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How do we interpret that? What does that passage mean? What does it mean to me today? How can I apply it to my life? Properly understanding scripture. Knowing the audience, knowing the author, knowing the context, knowing the passage. And how do we interpret it? Why do we pray in Jesus' name? Okay, JehovahWitness.org, you can see there, they say we pray in God's name because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That is their first mark on why we pray in Jesus' name. Because Jesus said, no one goes to the Father but through me. But this is lacking proper hermeneutics. Because the immediate verse to that, Thomas asked Jesus' a question. Jesus is saying, I'm about to go to heaven. I'm about to go. And I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And when I go, I will come and receive you. That way you can be where I am. And Thomas asked the question in verse 5. How do we know the way to go back to where you are? 
then Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Thomas says, you're going, to, you're, you're going away. We want to go with you, but we have no idea where. Jesus is talking about going ascending to heaven after his death, burial, resurrection. Thomas is questioning, how do we get there? How do we get to heaven where you are, where you're preparing a place? Jesus says, the only way you can go to heaven is through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you see, that's ultimately the true gospel, is salvation is found only in Christ. Okay? Now, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12, I believe it is. Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Salvation is only in Jesus because Jesus is the way, the truth, and and the life. He's the way to heaven. He's the truth of heaven. He's the life to get to heaven. And so this is proper hermeneutics right here. This is not why we pray in Jesus's name. This is how to get to heaven. How do we get eternal life? They can't even understand that simple interpretation of that passage, that verse. How are they going to understand deeper things, which we'll talk about here in a minute. That is an epic fail. Who is Jesus Christ? Who do they see Jesus is? Very, 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 very important for you to understand that whenever somebody wants to talk to you about Bible or about God or about Jesus, you need to ask him, who, who do you say Jesus is? After all, that's what Jesus asked the disciples, right? Who do men say that I am? John the Baptist, Elijah. What did Peter say? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So whenever somebody wants to talk to you about God or Jesus, first question should be, who do you say Jesus is? If they say Jesus is anything other than Son of God, Son of Man, fully man, fully, fully divine, second person of the Trinity, if they say anything but that, they're preaching another Jesus, which does not lead to eternal life. Okay, so that's very important. Jehovah Witness, they believe that Jesus was created. He was created by God. However, if you look in their own New World Translation, we see that there's Jesus is equated to God in numerous passages because man-made book, it doesn't fit their theology and some things weren't taken out that should have been taken out to fit their theology, such as John 20 verse 28. After the resurrection, one of Jesus's post-mortem experiences, uh, witnesses was to the disciples, but John, or I'm sorry, Thomas wasn't present. And so when Thomas did come the next day or whenever it was, uh, the disciples told him, we just saw Jesus, he was resurrected. Thomas did not believe. That's why he's called Doubting Thomas. But Jesus had another post-mortem resurrection uh, or appearance uh, to Thomas. And he says, put your finger here. See my hands. Take my hand. Take your hand. Put it in the side where I was pierced. What does Thomas say? Thomas says, my Lord, my God. For those people that say that Jesus never claimed to be God, they would have a hard time explaining why Jesus accepts worship if he's not God. Thomas says, clear as day, my Lord and my God. And nowhere here do you see Jesus rebuking Thomas for calling him God and worshiping him. You see, that's just one part. You get to Romans 10, 9 through 13 says Romans 10 is 9 for if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and exercise faith in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved and then it goes down for everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved here Je Jesus is called both Lord and Jehovah in the same breath by the same person Paul in the same context that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord you call on the name of Jehovah Jesus you will be saved now, I probably have another video on this talking about this particular passage and the role it plays in eschatology, not in salvation, but uh, this is another passage in the New World's Translation that shows that Jesus is equated with God or Jehovah. This is one of my favorites right here. If you were to ask them first, Revelation 1.17, ask them, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last in the living one and i became dead but look i am living forever and ever if you ask a jehovah witness who is that in revelation 1 speaking they'll rightly say that's jesus speaking 
Then you take him back to Isaiah 44, verse 6. You're still in their, their translation. And you tell them to read verse 6. This is what Jehovah says. King of Israel, his repurchaser, Jehovah of armies. I am the first. I am the last. There is no God but me. But that's exactly what Jesus said. Jesus claimed to be the first and the last. So now they already said that Jesus is in Revelation 1. Now Jehovah is in Isaiah 44. Jesus is claiming deity, claiming to be God. But if they say that, no, that's Jehovah in Revelation 1, then they have to explain when it says, I became dead, but look, I am living. They have to explain when did God the Father ever die. The Father never died. God the Son died on the cross to be the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, to be the satisfaction, to be that Passover lamb, Christ, Jesus, Messiah. Yeshua and the Mashiach. He's the one that died on the cross. He's the one that resurrected and ascended. Not God the Father. But still, this proves that Jesus and Jehovah are one and the same. They're parts of the Trinity, same uh, divine being. Then they get on the Holy Spirit. Who do they say or teach the Holy Spirit is? They teach that the Holy Spirit is God's active force or God's energy. This is God just sending an energy force, if you will, out to do his will. Well, if it's simply just energy, then explain in Acts chapter 5 why Peter accused Ananias to lie to the Holy Spirit. Can you lie to electricity? Can you lie to a wave current? Those are both forces. No, you cannot lie to them. This lying to the Holy Spirit reveals personhood. In order for a being or a thing to have personhood, it has to have three things. It has to have intellect, it has to have volition, and it has to have emotion. Intellect, volition, emotion. Okay, We see these aspects in the Holy Spirit. When people are trying to determine is the Holy Spirit a third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit reveals emotion, which we're about to see, intellect and volition, or free will. We see the free will in the intellect of the Holy Spirit, and in the fact that the Holy Spirit is said to be the one that gives spiritual gifts, and he gives spiritual gifts as he sees fit. So there we see intellect and free will, the Holy Spirit doing those two things. Here in Acts 5, we see emotion, of lying to the Holy Spirit but not only there in Ephesians 4 30 Paul writes do not grieve the Holy Spirit here it says do not grieve God's Holy Spirit if this is simply God's energy or active force Paul would be silly to saying don't grieve God's energy okay that's like me saying don't make electricity sorry or don't make that wave current sorry sorrowful that's just ridiculous it makes no sense the Holy Spirit is a third person as Trinity. This is another aspect where, again, volition, intellect, and emotion. This is the emotion aspect of the Holy Spirit to where you can, as a believer, make the Holy Spirit sorrowful by uh, just sinning. And you can read the passages there on different ways that one would make the Holy Spirit sorrowful. I encourage you not to do it. Study that out. It's a great study. But it contradicts their teaching that the Holy Spirit is simply an energy force. But then they have their famed 144,000 people. Again, fifth time making this video, my throat's starting to hurt a little bit. They teach that only 144,000 people would be able to live in heaven with God. The rest of the people that are believers, according to their scripture, will live here on earth. And then the others that are unbelievers, they just, they're, they're annihilated. They have no conscience, uh, consciousness. Uh, it's as if they'd never lived. They just quit thinking. You know, it's just going in eternal sleep, if you will. See, they strive to be one of these 144,000 witnesses to live in heaven with God. But one of the problems, again, using their own scripture, in Revelation 7 and in Revelation 14, we see that these 144,000 are out of the tribe of the sons of Israel. Okay, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes totaling 144,000. 
these are also ones who did not defile themselves with women okay so they're men they are virgins these are Jewish virgin males and then it goes on to say these are the ones who keep following the lamb no matter where he goes these are Jewish virgin males out of the 12 tribes of Israel who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ Jesus Christ is not a created being of God Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity therefore they cannot be 144,000 on four accounts number one Jewish they're not Jewish they're not uh, a male and they're most likely not a virgin but even still even if they were a Jewish virgin male in a Jehovah Witness cult they still couldn't be one of these 144,000 because they are not followers of the lamb and the lamb being Jesus Christ and the fact that they believe Jesus is created and he's revealed in scripture even in their scripture that he is equal with God he is God he's the second person of the Trinity and so we're witnessing to these two uh, black Jehovah Witness females and I looked at the one lady that was silent not doing any of the talk and I looked I was like look you're working so hard to be this 144,000 you can never be it because you are not a Jewish virgin male which is clearly revealed in not only my scripture but in your man-made scripture as well like I said if you're gonna witness to him focus on the one not doing the talking because you'll find that it's a little more beneficial and fruitful and their winds will be spinning so doctrinal errors you see that John 14 6 they can't even interpret a simple verse about how to get to heaven through the name of Christ through believing in his sacrifice John 20 28 Apostle Thomas refers to Jesus as Lord and God worships him and Jesus doesn't rebuke him Romans 10 9 and 13 Paul equates Jesus with Jehovah same thing with Revelation 1 and Isaiah 44 Jehovah and Jesus both declare they are the first and the last Jesus gives a qualifier that he was dead but now alive that points to the resurrection and the crucifixion the death burial resurrection of Christ the father never died the son did and is alive again this shows New Testament Old Testament in their scripture that Jesus Christ and Jehovah are one and the same Acts 5 and Ephesians 4 God's Holy Spirit is not an energy force is not an active force of God the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity again we see that the Holy Spirit reveals emotion because we can grieve the Holy Spirit intellect and free will or volition and the fact that he gives spiritual gifts to whom he pleases and so those three things make up personhood that the Holy Spirit has it is not an energy it is a third person of the Trinity and then Revelation 7 and 11 I think it's for it might be 11 I don't remember what chapter it is but reveals 144,000 cannot be a Jewish uh, or cannot be a Jehovah Witness member because they're from the 12 tribes of Israel and they're going to be 12,000 from each tribe Jewish virgin males and they got to be following Jesus Christ and we know that Jehovah Witnesses do not because they don't believe Christ is the son of the living God that he is God incarnate Emmanuel God with us so there you have it the third and final video of Jehovah Witnesses saw throughout the three videos this is simply a man-made organization uh, it's financially motivated which you'll see in the first video they control the religion they control the people through what they call their prophets or the governing body the faithful and discreet slave they use fear tactics to warn or to threaten their members of disfellowship a Jehovah Witness member gets disfellowshipped from their local kingdom hall they essentially lose their eternal life uh, according to their doctrines one of the ways that you can if you don't want Jehovah Witnesses to knock on your door or you don't want to talk to them just tell them you've been disfellowshipped from your kingdom hall I promise you they'll quit knocking on your door look at their own religious scripture has contradictions in their own theology which is exactly what one would expect if it was a man-made book which it is you looked at failed prophecies of the Battle of Armageddon date continually being pushed all the way out to 1938 1974 I believe it is and then hermeneutics 101 proper interpretation of scripture they fail miserably no man comes to the father but through me 
It's not how and why we pray in Christ's name. It's how one gets to heaven. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 So they can't even properly interpret one simple passage. They can't interpret deeper truths. So I hope this video series has been a blessing to you. Uh, hopefully at least you're a little more knowledgeable on the Jehovah Witnesses. If they knock on your door, maybe there's some things you could put in your toolkit to go ahead and be a witness of God to them, to pull them out, like Jude says, to snatch them out of the fire uh, so that they can get saved, find salvation through the true Christ, through the Messiah, uh, Yeshua, the Mashiach of the Old Testament, the only one through whom salvation can be found. Uh, John 3.16 God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and everything. So we need to go ahead and possibly be used of God to witness to them. But knowing a lot of times they're going to be hard headed. They're going to be so ingrained in their teaching and their doctrines that one way that we can be used of the Holy Spirit is to know what they believe. Be able to show how it's incorrect according to their own teachings the contradictions within their theology. So until next time, I hope this has been a blessing. God bless.